It's a moment the Sims family thought might never come. Curtis Sims' family reunion took place after a three-month battle with COVID. These last three months, every day, every minute, I prayed. He wanted to be back. We wanted him back. We were just trying to prepare for what might, what if, and, and just be ready for whatever happened. I love you. As he fought for his life at an Oklahoma hospital, Curtis says those prayers are what kept him going. I'll tell you one thing that it's really easy for me to feel, it's prayers. I don't know whether it's normal or not, but I could tell that people were, that people cared. Now, Curtis is grateful for another chance at life. Each breath is just a blessing nowadays. You just realize that it's not, you just don't want to take it for granted. Welcome home, Curtis. While this homecoming is one Woo! victory in the fight against COVID, more families across America are still grappling with the virus. As a country, one thing is certain. We're now engrossed in the deadliest period since the pandemic first began, almost a year ago. The month of January proving to be the deadliest, the virus claiming the lives of more than 95,000 people. So far, the U.S. has surpassed 26 million cases, over a million of those cases in L.A. County alone, the Southern California region where the virus has taken aim. Here, more than 16,000 people have died, the coroner's office desperately trying to keep up. At funeral homes, a similar story. This used to be a chapel. We used to have our viewing services here. Now it's been converted to a place where I have, I have to store multiple decedents. Last month, the chapel and the lobby were filled with coffins and bodies. In my caller ID, I, have, I don't even have a time to answer phone calls. My system is re, uh, reporting me like hundreds of calls a day. Over the weekend, the number of cases and deaths showed promising signs, but far from the clear. Officials still concerned that the community's hardest hit, Latinos in particular, continue to die at greater numbers than their neighbors. Our Latinx community is in fact bearing the worst of this pandemic. Since the latest surge, which began in November, Latino COVID deaths have gone up a thousand percent. Most of the deaths coming from low-income neighborhoods, made up mostly of Latino residents. Walking back to my car. Dr. Marina Del Rios is an ER physician at the University of Illinois Hospital for months warning of just how bad it could get among communities of color. For more than a year now, we've talked about the racial inequities with regard to COVID. Why is it that a year later we're still seeing such disparity when it comes to deaths and infection rates? Oh, well, boy, we're trying to fix a problem that's been existing for centuries. I think the best that we can do is try to keep that equity lens in mind as we're thinking about vaccine distribution. For the proud Puerto Rican, the fight against COVID has felt personal especially when she's in a field where less than 6% of all doctors identify as Latino. I've had shifts where my entire time in the emergency department has been people that could look like my mom or like my uncle or my brother. And how does the lack of Latino doctors impact the kinds of care Latino communities get? Oh boy, I mean, I'm a unicorn, right? There's that cultural disconnect and for a lot of Latinos, the language disconnect, right? Language is the most important tool that a physician has in taking care of patients. 80% of our diagnoses, we identify just by history, not even physical exam. So when you have a language discordance, your ability to be able to take care of of a person is greatly limited. Buenas tardes. For the last year, Dr. Del Rios has been part of the Illinois Latino COVID-19 initiative. One of the things that gives me great pride to report is the fact that the city of Chicago has rolled out a vaccine plan to prioritize the 10 zip codes with the highest rate of infection and mortality in the city. Are you optimistic that this disparity will be Bridged? Cautiously so. This is not something that's going to get fixed in the next few years. But I'm optimistic because at least we're using the words, we're having the discussions. And there's a lot of good people in leadership that want to want to see a change. As some wait for that dose of hope, others just thankful to have come out on the other side of the virus. You keep fighting. You keep fighting. You got this. 
It was last November when my colleague Matt Gutman first met Suzanne Sims at Comanche County Memorial Hospital. Her husband, Curtis, was hooked up to a ventilator, his health rapidly deteriorating. We're fighting a battle and we need to come together and work together. 57-year-old Curtis started feeling ill on Halloween. He initially waved off going to the hospital until about a week later when Suzanne says he was suffocating right in front of her. You don't know if the next time that he takes that deep breath, is that it? Following COVID protocols, she had to drop him off at the hospital, fully aware that she might never see him again. You just go to the parking lot and sit and cry. This is Dr. Trotter. Nine days later, Suzanne is given the chance to visit her husband, who's still sedated and not doing well. <sighs> Hey, babe, I love you. The kids came over and them grandbabies sure missed you at the house. They're ready for you to come home. I just love you so much. Don't you quit fighting on me. I need you at home. I need you home. The very next day, Curtis was airlifted to a hospital in Oklahoma City, where he took a turn for the worse. They called me twice and told me he wasn't going to make it. His heart went, went crazy, and they had to do CPR. Everybody was gathered at my house, and, and we just prayed, and we talked, and, and I called the next day, and, and they just told me, they said, well, he's stable. Back from the brink, Curtis was gradually weaned off the ventilator, his slow but steady healing process full of small wins. I'll never forget the doctor up there calling me. We FaceTimed on her phone. First thing he said was, I love you. Oh. You know, that was like, wow. And she looked at me and she said, he is one miracle. A miracle who's now working on regaining strength in his legs and has weeks of physical therapy ahead of him before he can go home. Every day when I wake up, I can tell I'm stronger than I was the day before. It's probably gonna take a lot more time than what I'm gonna be comfortable with, but I just gotta be patient and let it happen as it happens. This may sound stupid, but I really wanna get back on a horse. There's a lot of things I wanna do, but there's, I really want to get back on a horse and just ride across the pasture. His unwavering faith is what he says saved him, a faith the Sims hope to share with families whose loved ones are still suffering from COVID. I didn't know whether what was happening out on the world outside or around me, but in my, in my mind, I knew that I needed to talk to God. You know, I just say pray. Pray as hard as you can. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.